Welcome, everyone. I am Paul Rogers, Curator of Public Programs and Education at the Museum of Art and Design, Miami-Dade College, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Art and Social Engagement, Rafael Lozano Himmer in conversation with Dr. Maria Fernandez. A couple of things before we get started. Uh, the Body Electric, the exhibition for which this conversation tonight accompanies, will be open until May 30th. And those of you who are capable of going to the exhibition, I strongly, strongly suggest you try to make it. A couple of uh, process uh, uh, points to make here. Our presenters will dialogue for roughly an hour and then we will open up for a Q&A. Please submit any questions you have by clicking the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can submit uh, any questions you have anytime during the talk. Rafael Lozano Himmer is a media artist working at the intersection of architecture and performance art. He creates platforms for public participation using technologies such as robotic lights, digital fountains, computerized surveillance, media walls, and telematic networks. Maria Fernandez is Associate Professor of Art History and Visual Studies at Cornell University. Her research interests include the history and theory of digital art, post-colonial, decolonial, and gender studies, Latin American art and architecture, and the intersections of these fields. She is the author of Cosmopolitanism in Mexican Visual Culture, for which she was awarded the RV Prize by the Association for Latin American Art in 2015. Please, I know you're not capable of giving a warm welcome that they can hear, but nonetheless, please give our speakers a warm welcome. Enjoy the program. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. I would like to thank the Museum of Art and Design, my, Miami-Dade College, and Director Rina Carbajal for pro providing us with the opportunity to hold this conversation. To Paul Rogers for his invitation and for his assistance at every step of the way to make this event possible. Paul is the Curator of Public Programs and Education, of course, as he said and to Brandon, who is managing all the technology for this meeting. Um, lastly, but last but not least, I would like to thank Rafael Lozano Hemmer for graciously agreeing to have this conversation with me. For me, it is always a delight to speak with him um, as I always benefit from his enormous and lively intellect. Um, so maybe we can begin the conversation with the piece that is in the exhibition Body Electric that Paul just mentioned um, at the museum. So Surface Tension from 1992, Rafael, is one of your earliest works. Can you tell us what, le what led you to make it? For sure. Thank you so much, Maria, and uh, thank you uh, to the museum and to Paul and Brandon. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I actually prepared a bunch of uh, slides because it's easier to actually illustrate uh, the works than describe them. And that way we can, uh, we can uh, have a very uh, shared reference. So because I knew you would ask me about surface tension, I actually prepared a slide of it. So let me just try and share my screen and make sure that we are all seeing uh, the same thing. So this is, uh, uh, can you confirm that you can see uh, this slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, excellent. So just uh, to start, mention that I am a Mexican artist that lives in Canada and works in a team of about 16 people from seven countries in a studio that I founded, co-founded called Antimodular Studio. So everything that you're about to see is the result of the work of collaboration between different fields. I myself have a chemistry degree. Uh, I have architects and industrial designers and programmers and artists and so on and so forth from all these uh, countries. So I'm extremely lucky to work like that. 
Um, the first artwork that, um, that I made that I was proud of was this work called Surface Tension, which is basically a human eye that follows you wherever you walk. Originally designed as a stage design feature for artists, of, sorry, for dancers or actors to control the computer graphics. Uh, later, we found that what was really effective was to open it up to the general public. This person is a, a person who came to see the theater play and then tried out the installation itself to find out that it really was interactive, that it was following her wherever she went. The work um, was inspired by the very first uh, intelligent bombs, which were um, used in the first Gulf War. And as Mexican philosopher Manuel de Landa talks about the idea that cameras now had the executive uh, capability to observe and acquire targets without human intervention. And so this so-called intelligence brought out a sense of the awareness of the, of the, um, in, the in the case of a bomb, uh, of its surroundings, in the case of this artwork, of who is the observer and who is the observed. So this is a, a, a very early work. It's also the first and only work that I program myself. That's uh, a piece that is uh, programmed in a thing called Director, which most young people won't know, but it's Macromind, a very, very early uh, authoring thing. And then later I started working with, uh, about that. Later, I started working with programmers who were more talented than I was and uh, started making more complex uh, pieces. Okay, so after surface tension, most of your work includes technologies of surveillance. It's been a constant um, in your work. In your um, in, in, in your work, the technologies function as one would expect them to function. So trackers track, voice and face recognitions recognize, search lights search with powerful light beams, but they enable results that are different from the way the technologies are normally used. You have said that your aims include materializing surveillance and making technologies of connection rather than technologies of suspicion. Would you elaborate on those ideas? For sure. Um, the, the approach of surveillance is not about the novelty of it. Um, I find it very important to underline the work of somebody like Marta Minujín, who is an Argentinian artist, she's still alive, who in 1964-65 uh, first used a uh, live camera, video camera, trained on the public in an in art installation. I mention her for two reasons. First of all, the pioneer of live video art in, you know, sort of contemporary art is not Nine Doom Pike or Dan Graham or any of the, or Julia Scher or any of the usages of surveillance in art that we have seen since but it's in fact uh, Marta Minujín, this Argentinian lady in, in 1964. And so it breaks stereotypes about Latin American development. But the second reason I really love to quote this is because this was over 50 years ago. And so we can talk about a tradition of surveillance being used um, for both uh, a seductive approach, so the idea of being included in the artwork as completing the artwork, but also as a policing, as a kind of ominous reminder of the technologies of, of control. So in this work, for example, it's called uh, Zoom Pavilion. It's a collaboration with uh, Polish artist Krzysztof Wodziszko. And Krzysztof was telling me that when he was young in communist Poland, there were rules about how many people could assemble in public space and how close to each other they could be before they were um, deemed an illegal assembly. So there was a suspicion about people coming together in public space. So for this collaboration, our first one, we decided to make a system that would make this um, tracking of not individuals, but relationships between individuals evident. So the system would basically detect how far away you were from each other, how long you spent to, uh, close to each other, and would then determine whether your activity was suspicious or not, 
and archive you in a massive archive of the relationships of everybody who was in it. So that's that screen that you see in the back. So this artwork uh, first done in 2015 is a piece that has um, exactly what I'm looking for in this kind of surveillance systems. Uh, surveillance is not a small image that you see in a, a closed circuit TV monitor as, as a, you know, as a um, uh, guard might, but it's in fact amplified to an architectural scale. And what's important to me is that, so you're making evident the methods of, of surveillance, but you're also just keeping right in the line between the violence of the tracking system. So we have three different tracking systems in here, blob tracking, uh, shape tracking, and face recognition. Um, and the, the seduction of being included, of participation, reality TV, the selfie, how do we um, engage and resolve around this kind of, uh, you know, uh, insidious existence of, of the surveyed image? So oftentimes, you're right, I use the technologies for what they were used, but also we, we at the studio really like to pervert what they're being used for. So a good example, also in the realm of surveillance, is this work. Um, as people may know, um, years back, 43 students in the community of Ayotzinapa in Iguala, in Guerrero in Mexico, were disappeared. And um, it's a long story, but basically they were kidnapped. And we don't know where these uh, 17 to 21 year old boys are. And the families uh, do not believe the official story that the government uh, calls out because there's no forensic evidence that they were murdered by the Guerreros Unidos drug cartel. And so the communities are still looking for these 43. When I first heard this, I thought, you know, routinely at the studio, we work with face recognition systems. So this is an artwork which is trained with a neural network with the faces of the 43 that disappeared from Ayotzinapa. When you stand in front of it, the system measures the distance of your eyes and the shape of your jaw and the distance between your nose and your mouth and it finds who you look like the most. And then it produces a result. So for example, it might say, you look most like Martin Getsemani Garcia, but then it tells you a level of confidence. It says, you know, we think that the chances that you are Martin Getsemani Garcia are 17%. And then it says, result, student not found. So this is an artwork that is kind of like a memorial um, to keep the search alive constantly. It also tries to create a certain link of fraternal empathy, if you will, because in a sense, these are not just the kids who were kidnapped. They, 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 they're, they're part of us. They could be you next. Um, and so this kind of likeness, this search is, is to try and, and create a, a, an intimacy with, with these images. Most importantly, the project actually uh, produces income. So whenever it's actually being exhibited or sold, all of the proceeds are actually sent to the family members of the disappeared to help them with forensic analysts, to, with their lawyers, with the orphans that the, that the kidnap left behind. So it's kind of not really an artwork, but more a campaign, a way for you to, for us, to be able to have an artwork that can constantly generate income and awareness about, uh, you know, about the, the plight of this Ayotzinapa. One last thing to mention about this project is that it's completely open source. You can download it from our website for free. And so any university or museum in the world can, can use this. And we've had hundreds of museums now um, sort of download the work and exhibit it. But equally importantly, the source code is open so that anybody could reuse the same technologies for their own search. So here in Canada, we're working with a, a indigenous group of programmers and they are programming it not to look for the 43 students of Ayotzinapa, but to look for the over 1000 Aboriginal women, indigenous women that have been kidnapped and no one knows where they, they are for the past 10 years in Canada. So to me, the, this kind of artwork is a misuse of the technologies. It's not looking for who the culprits are. It's looking for the victims. Um, yes. I stop there. With that that's one. very helpful. Um, that's very helpful. And, and so it's, it's still active. 
Yeah, so the, the artwork, uh, you can download it. You go to lozano-hammer.com, Level of Confidence is the project's name, and you can download either the software, which just runs on any computer. Um, and so this was very important because we wanted it to be shown across Mexico, you know, the, the, the country, and uh, inexpensively be able to have this artwork as a campaign virally. But then the source code is available through our GitHub. So at the end of the talk, if people are interested, I have the URL. If you're a programmer, you can download our code and make your own version of one of these um, search uh, artworks. Okay, wonderful. So um, this is really uh, great. The human body in interaction with technology has been fundamental to art and digital media. And I think the exhibition uh, recognizes that. Especially in the first decade of the century, this led some artists and also theorists to describe this art as both interactive and embodied. Your work always includes the participants, but instead of focusing on the body, you are concerned with aspects that are inseparable and often essential to bodies but they are not parts of bodies. This includes shadows, voice, heartbeat, and breath. What attracts you to those incorporeal aspects of the body? So um, I, I chose four, four different artworks to illustrate this. So I'll start playing them in the background to talk about um, the, 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 the body in, um, in this kind of interactive experience. So I came, um, I, I graduated and I started getting interested in technology and I found that the initial virtuality systems, uh, the programming, the early internet, all of that was very solitary. It was all sort of based on this cyberpunk idea of kind of leaving the meat behind, the body was left behind and it's your brain that did the traveling. And as somebody who was interested in a more social or more connective or more out of control democratic platform, I felt that the body needed to be included in these virtual systems, um, that somehow um, it, it would be of importance to be able to amplify the body instead of, of uh, minimizing it or, or ignoring it as meat, to amplify it to the scale of a simulation. So I started a series in 1996 called Relational Architecture. And you're seeing here the third piece in the Relational Architecture series, which is about this amplification of the body. So this work called Body Movies basically takes hundreds of photographs taken of people in the city where the project is presented, projected from very tall towers onto the facade of this uh, Schauber Plain building in Rotterdam. And then very powerful projectors on the ground cast the shadow of passersby who then may choose to embody or to take over or overlap with uh, their shadow with a portrait. And so um, ad hoc, uh, playful experiences would come out of this installation with people just sort of creating these narratives um, out of nowhere. So if no one's participating, you don't really see anything. You just see a building that's 60 foot high by 120 foot wide, that is just you know brightly lit with uh, white light. But as soon as people cross the path of the bottom lights and cast their shadows, you start getting this kind of overlap and this embodiment, which I found was uh, was um, successful um, as a, as an interaction. Uh, the tracking system, if this is very early, this is 2001, is computer vision system that tells the computer where shadows are in such a way that when there's the overlap of uh, a shadow and uh, um, a portrait, automatically the system creates a little MIDI sound, like a little feedback on the, in the plaza click. But more importantly, once all of the portraits in a given scene were revealed, automatically the computer would uh, cue new ones. So we see it here. Um, these three people kind of collaborate, reveal all the portraits, and automatically the computer um, darkens the image and cues the new one for people to reorganize in public space. Because the project is not really about the, 
their portraits. It's about becoming the portraits. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, working with shadows is that they're very intuitive. So we all have a sophisticated language of what we can do with shadows. Also, most cultures have a sophisticated um, theater of shadows or puppetry. And, um, and so there's no instructions, really. Nobody tells you what to do or not to do. And this, this really creates uh, a, the spirit of being out of control. For me, the most important thing in these interactive works is that nobody controls you. Nobody tells you what to do or not to do. And, and this, is, this is key. Also, um, showing the interface. So how does the vigilance, the surveillance happen? Uh, the, in, in Rotterdam, we had this uh, display that showed you the tracking system together with explanations in English and Dutch. But to most people, you know, they didn't really care about how it was done. They would just uh, start ad hoc narratives um, that would basically bring together people who normally don't speak to each other. It's almost like these people, for example, don't know each other, and yet they're, they're doing a little narrative uh, that they're creating on the fly. So I think very much that re-embodying public space is, um, is, a, is an important thing to do because there is a sense of, of, of place. Um, sometimes it's quite cruel. This lady abused her boyfriend for three hours and uh, the boyfriend enjoyed it. Um, but the, the idea that the content is entirely generated by the representations of, of people is, is, is an important kind of aspect. In that sense, I call my works platforms uh, for self-representation. So people really, they can choose not to look at the portraits. Um, they just basically relate to each other. Um, so this artwork is a, it's, it's, a, it's a piece that I've done now in about 12 countries. We've done it in China, we've done it in Portugal, we've done it in Canada, many, many different countries. And it's very interesting to see how we negotiate the space of our bodies in relation to others. Um, what I like is that you can have your own participation, your own body, and then in relation to a bigger tableau, which is a collective or connective experience of everybody who's at the plaza. So um, this is body movies. Um, I'll show a couple of other pieces that feature embodiment. This one is just a quick one. Uh, Juan Vucetich is the inventor of the fingerprinting for, um, for forensic and detective analysis. Uh, we made a project which um, basically scans your fingerprint and creates an electrocardiogram as you stick your finger into this device. And, um, and then it adds, it records everybody's um, fingerprint together with their pulse in an array of over 10,000 images from the past. So as you're walking into this, this is in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, in Australia, when you're walking in, you see all of these uh, fingerprints. So something that is used for identification becomes more of a landscape of anonymity. And then finally, also for, for the body embodiment uh, question, I, I pulled out this image from a piece I made in Los Angeles, um, which is basically these two um, sandboxes. So those trusses that you see there are basically two sandboxes. And at night, when you would come to see this project, you would stick your hand into the sandbox and automatically your hand would be projected onto the beach massively. And so um, there was this amplification of your presence to play with the people on the beach. But at the same time, we were recording and detecting the people at the beach. You see those black dots in the sandbox? That's actually the people on the beach. So you can see them and they can see you and you share three different scales. So this is a project in which, um, again, there was nothing to see. There was no show. There was no script. There was no score. It was just whatever people came up with. And I found that these are the projects that I, that I enjoy very much because they're surprising. I don't know what people are going to come up with in the end. In a project such as Sandbox, which is what you're seeing, um, we did it, for example, um, we've done it, for example, in Seoul, Korea. We did it in Barcelona and in LA. Uh, one day I would love to take it to Miami. 
but it's very different depending on the city. So this is LA, so people bring their doggies with booties and um, they're uh, doing that. There's a guy here. I mean, I have hours and hours of material. Um, this guy, for example, likes to burn people. This guy doesn't like to be burnt, so he kind of moves away. Um, there is, this is Coca-Cola man. So somebody brought a can of Coke and then this fellow was just trying to not be circumscribed by the can. So it's, it's kind of a, a playful piece, um, very much inside of, of this um, carnivalesque, Nuit Blanche um, kind of, how do we come together uh, in public space in an activity other than shopping? And so I, I find it important to, to use the body as the way to take over that space. And, um, and so this is a project called Sandbox. Oh, and actually I have one last one for the embodiment section. Um, this is um, a piece that I did in 2019 across the US-Mexico border. Um, so I'm in El Paso, Texas, and I'm touching a sensor, which is actually capturing my heartbeat. My so that heartbeat. first light bulb that you see over there, that's my heartbeat being detected by the um, electrodes that I'm touching with my hands. At the same time, as, I'm, as it's doing that, we are sending over the internet my heartbeat to an identical station in Mexico, in, Mexico, in Ciudad Juarez, across the U.S.-Mexico border. And there, I'm waiting for someone to touch it on their side. Now they touched it, and now you're seeing their heartbeat start to uh, flash on the second light bulb. What's important, though, is that there's haptic feedback. In fact, my hands are vibrating to the rhythm of the other's heart and vice versa. So you feel their heartbeat and they feel yours. The project's called Remote Pulse. And it was done, uh, of course, at a time of intense adversarial nationalism at the border during Trump's time. Um, and it was a very, very um, successful piece in the sense that people um, felt like their participation had a sense of, of intimacy and an erasure of this border. Um, the two cities of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez are sister cities. 70% of the people in one side have family members on the other side. So to bring them together through this kind of remote telepresent um, heart interface was, was successful. I should mention that this artwork I um, donated to the cities of El Paso and Juarez, and they will install them permanently so that at any given time, you can go and feel the heartbeat of the person on the other side of the border. So this one's called um, Remote Pulse, and okay, and that's, that's it for embodiment. You know, it, it's, um, it's really remarkable that in this works, even though, you know, you're focusing on, on the kind of um, non-script nature of the pieces and on the, on the body and on play, they're also really serious. And this combination is actually something that really interested me about your work. That is, it, it's, it always has those, those components of, you know, really free play and yet really serious topics. But I want to go on to other works that you have made um, that still have to do with the body. You have made several works that center on breath, including the last breath of 2012 and vicious circular breathing of 2013. These works were really powerful at the time they were made, but they have increased poignancy in light of COVID-19, Black, Black Lives Matter, and increased media attention to climate change. How did your ideas for those works develop? Yeah, so, so for the past 10 years at the studio, we've been um, sort of specializing on thinking about atmospheric issues. So how, how can we represent the commons? Um, at the time where we made Vision Circular Breathing, um, a few years before, the CEO of Nestle, of the um, company Nestle, um, talked about how water was not a fundamental human right. 
And so, of course, he would say this because they own San Pellegrino and Evian and all the water bottling is mostly Nestle. So the question of the commons, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the, the land that we stand on, and the ownership of something that does not have national borders, such as the atmosphere, is of, of, of intense interest to me. So what I wanted to do, I don't know if you remember this movie, um, it's a terrible movie, but it features John Travolta as an immunosuppressed uh, patient, a little bubble boy who lives inside of a protective shell that keeps him you know, safe. Well, the way I think of the planet is we are 7.7 .7 billion people and we are the bubble boy. <laughs> we are finally breathing an air that has 422 parts per million of carbon dioxide. No human in the history of humankind has ever had to breathe this level of carbon dioxide. And we know that COVID is just the first symptom of globalization wanting to kill us through the atmosphere. So this tiny little virus has actually put us all on our knees. Millions of people have lost their life because of it. And yet, as a people, we react in terms of nationalism and populism and all these other mechanisms to protect ourselves against the planetary problem. And so I really like Buckminster Fuller's idea that you know, planetary problems need planetary solutions. So what could I do as an artist? Um, I decided to create this piece um, called Vicious Circular Breathing. I'll describe it a little bit. It's basically a hermetically sealed glass chamber that you can enter if you don't heed the warnings. There's warnings against asphyxiation, contagion, and panic. And basically, you press a little button, it lets you into a decompression chamber, so clean air enters with you into this little decompression chamber, and then two valves get rid of all the clean air. And then, once all the clean air is gone, you're invited to go into a main cabin and sit down and breathe the air that has already been breathed by everybody before you. So it's stale, recycled air. You're sharing viruses, bacteria, pheromones, or any airborne pollutants with the people in the past. As you sit there, your breath and everybody's breath that is kept by this machine goes out a set of tubes and bellows, motorized bellows that were inspired by 17th century uh, organs in Europe. Uh, that create a vacuum and pressure. And then a set of electromechanical valves we designed at the studio to uh, operate 61 brown paper bags, which inflate and deflate approximately 10,000 times a day, which is a normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. So the whole system was meant to be like a representation of this recycled air. For me, it was important to create an artwork um, that would have a critical sort of approach to the subject of, of the atmosphere. In this work, most, most of the times when we're making interactive work, myself and colleagues always say things like, well, this piece you can personalize and it can empower you and you can have agency and you can you know, amplify yourself. In this piece is different, it's more perverse. In this piece, if you participate too long, you die. Um, and for me, the message that participation in this particular piece is actually making the air more toxic for future participants is an important kind of, um, you know, sort of um, emphasis that I want to put that interactive systems are not here to empower us, to give us more possibilities and so on and so forth, and pretend that we are in a techno optimist, infinite um, sort of growth kind of situation, but rather how do we represent the limits that we have in the atmosphere. So that's what this piece is. I made it originally presented in Istanbul, then in Madrid, then in Mexico, in Montreal. It, it, when I first did it, when I first realized this project, I did not intend to go into it. Uh, I did not intend people to go in it. It was more like a design um, conceptual piece but actually people line up to go into the work and breathe this stale air. And after four or five months, it's actually quite repugnant to be inside. Um, 
Of course, this artwork was supposed to premiere in the United States at SF MoMA in my retrospective, which was supposed to happen last year. And as you can imagine, because of COVID, it didn't. But the show is still on. So it's going back on uh, in October of this year. We're not going to show this piece, but I think that this piece was speaking a little bit about, you know, this kind of cautionary tale of, um, of the limits of the commons. So that's, uh, that's that piece. And we've done many other breathing pieces, but just so that we can move to, to other pieces, I won't show them. I'm, I am fascinated by breathing being this kind of, the air that is inside of your lungs is private. And then as you breathe or as you speak, you convert it into the public. And then there is a strange kind of circulation of contagion that happens beyond the membranes of our tympani, just uh, sort of hearing the sounds. There's also the ingestion of somebody else's air. And I think that those are, are questions that have interested artists for a long time. So I'm thinking of uh, Manzoni, I'm thinking of uh, Marina Bramovic with her asphyxiation piece with Ule. I'm thinking of um, Zeng who would like put himself in these bubbles. Um, asphyxiation, I think, is a ripe uh, place to think about this idea of the atmosphere as a site for some of the most important you know, um, fights that are coming, right? And by fight, I mean, um, you know, we're living in a climate extinction event already. Every three minutes, a different species disappears from the planet. This is not science fiction, is not a promise, is not two sides of the story. This is actually happening. So I think that as artists, we need to somehow, um, you know, sort of direct some of our work to think about this issue of, of you know, how do we how do we survive in the atmosphere? How do we coexist with it, and how do we um, repair the best that we can um, the damage that we're making every day? Those are really powerful, and we could spend another month talking about your breath pieces because they deal with a lot of different issues that again you know, are consistent in your work. So in this piece, you talk about contagion, but of course, interpenetration of bodies is a constant in your work, even before COVID-19, before, you know, even uh, you began working with breath. Um, I'm thinking of the ancient piece, El Rastro, <laughs> or the trace, but in any case, um, thanks. We can talk more about those um, in the, in the Q&A if people are interested. Several of your works deal with memory, individual and social. In fact, some of your works, such as Voz Alta, Level of Confidence, and A Crack in the Hourglass, which is um, a recent one, which is now an exhibit at MUAC or Museo um, de Arte Contemporánea in Museo Universitario de Arte Contemporánea in Mexico, can be thought of as memorials. I don't mean a traditional memorial in the form of a monument, but a kind of commemorative event that also engages with the political. Would you comment on the relationship between technology, memory, and politics in your work? For sure, yeah. So I, I, I chose three projects to illustrate that. Um, I often think of, of an artist as a citizen. So on the one hand, I mistrust artists, including myself, who go out there and moralize about specific political agendas or propagandas. On the other hand, as a citizen, you need to react to a situation. And so oftentimes, if my work is political, it's not so much about the politics of, of parties or the part, politics of ideology, it's more about the micropolitics of people connecting with each other in a public space and generating sort of new narratives. Um, having said that, there have been times when I've been actually commissioned to create uh, an artwork to remember to 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 use this memory as a as a specific 
palette in the creation of a work. And so for the next work that I'll show, it's actually a commission by the Universidad de UNAM, uh, which is a very autonomous university in Mexico City, to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the massacre of the students of Tlatelolco in uh, Mexico City. In, in 1968, um, the students in Tlatelolco, about 300, um, depending on who you read, uh, were murdered and uh, the authorities were um, you know, this is about 10, 10 days before the, um, the Olympics were to start. And the media completely silenced the, um, the, the, the reporting of this. The blood was cleaned that very night. And for many years, for many decades, it was a taboo subject to speak about the, the massacre of students. And, um, a number of artists got invited to do a memorial to, to remember this. And I didn't want it to just be like a monolith with their names. I wanted to do something that would relate to today's plights. And so what we did is we uh, designed a megaphone um, that would convert people's voices into flashes of light so that it would be right from the plaza where the massacre took place. So it looks like Los mártires, todas aquellas personas que lucharon, que vieron por el futuro, pues muchas veces los dejamos en el olvido o solo recordamos... And when you speak, your voice hits the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so you are at the site where the massacre took place, the light becomes a beacon that hits the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And very important, the microphone, the megaphone is not moderated or censored. People take turns to speak into it. And the truth is that what we felt, what we saw was unbelievable. We had survivors of the massacre, like this lady here who is speaking about um, her experience of being there. You had neighbors and students. You had intellectuals from 68 speaking their mind. You also had contemporary activists speaking about contemporary massacres or more recent massacres, Acteala, Guas Blancas, and so on. And so it was really a platform for people's voice to become evident in an urban scale. This searchlight that we use is the brightest in the world. It's a 7,000 watt searchlight that can be seen from a 10 mile radius. And so when you have an open mic situation, um, authorities are concerned over censorship and so on and so forth. Um, my experience with an open mic is that, especially if it's in the context of something uh, like the, the, the remembrance of, of the massacre, it becomes an extremely in interesting political tool. So this lady, for example, is speaking out against the church who during the massacre closed its door, closed its doors and did not give uh, protection to the students who were being shot at. Um, and so the political arises, emerges out of a platform of self-representation without you needing to be moralistic or sort of pre, predetermining how this piece is going to be used. So it was really beautiful. Um, perhaps the best thing I've ever done in the sense of not what I did, but what people ended up uh, using the piece for. Um, so another element of this project is that the searchlight would hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from there, three other lights would beam in three directions of Mexico City. And if you were in your house or in your home or your work and you would look out the window or your car and you would see this flashing lights, you could actually tune in to 96.1 FM Radio UNAM to listen live to what the lights were saying. So we converted the voice both into light and FM radio so that any statement could actually become, um, you know, uh, audible into the media realm because radio frequency is a public space. And so we wanted the voice of people to, to be also amplified in that way. Um, the project lasted for a couple of weeks every night. Um, for about three or four hours, the radio would be given to us so that people could speak their mind. And this is very powerful radio, it can be heard all over Mexico City. Um, when no one was speaking, it was interesting because we couldn't have silence. So what we did is we would play back archival recordings 
of um, survivors and intellectuals and so on, uh, student leaders. And then we would mix the memory of those who, uh, who were affected by the massacre and the student movement of 68 together with the voices of contemporary um, speakers uh, in it. Of course, not everything was terrible. We had uh, marriage proposals and little kids and poets and so on participate. And that's part of the vibrancy of a public space artwork is that you just get people um, participating uh, in a way that you cannot control. So this is uh, Bos Alta and it's, as you said, it's not really a monument. In a way, it's an anti-monument because it's not about trying to make um, a, a perennial, you know, constant, um, you know, slab of memory, but rather it's a fluid situation. It's more of a performance or a radio broadcast. Um, I wanted to show on the subject of breathing and the atmosphere, this quote from Akele Membe from the Universal Right to Breathe, because you were mentioning COVID um, and I think that there's already a question about COVID. So we at my studio specialize in bringing people together. We really believe in shared experiences. How can we as artists create what um, Marxist philosopher, uh, sorry, Marxist composer Frederick Chevsky calls coming together. Very, very simple concept, which is in my opinion, the most important objective of art. How do we bring people together? And at a moment of social distancing, at a moment where millions of people are dying, according to the absolutely worst predictions of what we could possibly imagine this virus could do, there is a situation where people are not being able to go into the funerals of their loved ones. So, for example, I, I know of a case of a friend whose dad had a cough and then went to the hospital and they never saw him again you know, three weeks later he was dead and then the body was toxic so they couldn't even see the body. And then the funeral happened with very, very few people there because of social distancing and it was impossible to travel. So in this quote by Akile Membe, we talk about this importance of mourning. And so on the subject of what we did during COVID is we set up a website um, called, um, called A Crack in the Hourglass in English, in Spanish, um, is uh, a different name, but crackinthehourglass.net if you want to see it in English. And it's basically an opportunity for anybody who has lost a loved one or a friend to send the photograph of this person. It's received automatically in a server here in Montreal. And then we have a robot arm which drops hourglass sand, so very fine grains of sand, to draw the likeness, the picture that you've just sent. The system gives you a time. It says, okay, your portrait is going to be presented in 40 minutes or in 80 minutes or whatever. And it allows you to invite other people to come and view this life so that if you, if your loved one, um, you know, uh, died and you had no opportunity to mourn, this would be an opportunity because everybody can log in and see the build up, very, very slow build up of the portrait with grains of sand. It takes about 20 minutes per portrait. So it's purposely done slowly. And then once a portrait, once a portrait has been created, a web page is made, made for each and every participant with an obituary and so on. And then the most important part of this is that once a portrait has been drawn, automatically we tilt the platform where the sand is and with gravity, pull down all of the sand and recover it for it to be recycled to make new portraits. So this moment of disappearance is uh, seen as the, 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 the moment of understanding this loss and, uh, and seeing it happen. So right now we have uh, hundreds of portraits sent by people with their dedications and every, every web page has like an image of it. And for me, it's two things. On the one hand is when we hear the statistics, you know, we think, oh yeah, well, whatever, in the United States, 500,000 people have died. And we don't really understand what these numbers are. But when we see the faces, when we see the stories behind this loss, we begin to understand the magnitude of the problem. 
And I think that that's one usage of art. On the one hand, it helps you mourn, but on the other hand, it also talks about a continuity, right? All of the portraits painted or drawn by this system are drawn with a very same small amount of sand that can fit in my hand. So we just keep using it as that sense of, of fluidity from one unique life to another. And so this is what we did during um, during uh, COVID, and the project's still live. Um, it's uh, if you go to a crack in the hourglass.net, you will see the archive and uh, and uh, be able to see what uh, people said. Some of it is terrible, like a 15 year old um, uh, person is is the youngest one we have in it. And finally. Um, the this artwork that I want to speak about, which is um, a project I did across the US Mexico border. So at the same time as I was doing the piece with the remote heartbeats, we created this piece which created bridges of light across the US Mexico border. And it consisted of a little six stations, three in Mexico and three in the United States, with a little robotic wheel. You see it right there in front of the boy, that wheel that you see there, if you turn it, you basically control you 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 control where the searchlights in your station are pointing toward. So as you tune that dial, the searchlights scan the horizon across the border. And when my lights and your lights intersect in midair, the computer automatically knows that the bridge has been completed and it opens a bi-directional channel of communication so that you can hear what they're saying and they can hear you. And so people would start having ad hoc conversations across the US-Mexico border, which was really fascinating. One thing that could happen to is if you didn't like what the other person was saying, you could just tune them out and look for somebody else in the other five stations. So it was more an interface about hearing each other. So these two ladies, for example, um, don't really know each other. And this is what happened. Hello. ¿Tiene familiares aquí? Sí, allá tengo bastantes familiares. ¿Y si viene seguido para acá? Uh, por el temor a Walma, lo que pasó. Yo tengo a mi madre y a mi hermano allá. Tengo años sin verlos. por un motivo de pasar acá no puede venir o por temor a lo que ha estado sucediendo. Um, ellos también por eso no vienen, por temor. Así es. Y nos comunicamos por teléfono, es la única manera. Oh, um, no. Pero sé que están bien. Gracias a Dios. Extraño mucho la comida de Juárez, eso sí. Ah, es mi favorita eso sí, muy ir a... So over the period of um, two weeks, tens of thousands of people came to the border um, in, in an exercise of trying, like Ronald Rael says, you know, to use the border not as a place of separation, but as a place to come together. So a lot of the time, what you saw is families that were separated would come together and speak to each other. But we also had a lot of flirting and serenades, people singing to each other across the border. Um, you know, she would ask, well, how old are you? He'd say, well, I'm 18. And then her friends would go, oh, she's 18 too. And then they would exchange like Facebook addresses. It was really lovely. The spirit was to try and have a continuity of landscape across the, the, the border, to take over the atmospheric uh, location for the site of this communication to actually happen. When I first arrived at, um, at Paso and Juarez, I thought I would do a different project, but I realized that people there are sick of the border, sick of talking about the wall. They want to talk instead about how many things actually connect them, because these two sister communities, first of all, existed even before the US uh, was a country and had a, a border then in 1848, but more importantly, there is an interdependence. So they are connected economically and fraternally and historically and in environmentally. And it was really exciting to 
to to see the border not just about pain and separation and drugs and and talk of rapists and whatever but to talk about how do people coexist how can they be interdependent i have to mention that the mayor of uh the mayor of El Paso, who's a Republican, actually took the microphone and let me fast forward to him. So this is a veteran of war who fought for the United States in Vietnam and now has been deported. Um, you know, this is the mayor of the Republican mayor of El Paso, who actually contradicted Trump when Trump went to El Paso. Trump said, oh, you know, now El Paso is safer because of the wall. And he said, no, Mr. President, El Paso has already been one of the safest cities in the United States for the past 30 years. And it's precisely because of our relationship with um, our Mexican brothers and sisters and the economic exchange and all of these other things. So I appreciated that um, from him. Um, the project also heard from indigenous communities. So often we think of the border lands as, as bilingual English and Spanish, but you have the Raramuri, the Ende, you have the Tiwa, other um, original peoples who took the opportunity to speak in their languages and, uh, and sort of clarified, you know, the bigger historical perspective of the regions. And throughout the, the, the presentation, we had uh, a number of events um, like uh, concerts and poets and historians speaking into the region because we wanted to start each day with a group, uh, a, a different sort of collective coming to, to speak. Um, and then the microphones would open to the general public. So this is Batallones Femeninos, uh, a great uh, feminist hip hop band out of Ciudad Juarez, uh, Adelitas Fronterizas on the other side uh, for LGBT, LGBTQ night. Um, we had um, a Mexican wrestler um, called Casandro El Exotico, who um, was the first gay um, world champion and uh, he was speaking across to Mistov, who is a German wrestler uh, who lives in Juarez now. And at one point she says, well, I'm from Berlin and I'm here to tell you that walls come down. And then everybody started clapping. It was a really uh, beautiful moment. Um, so uh, how do we make artworks that can be populated and animated and it, they can be, um, alternatives to the way in which we're conducting our cities. And so this artwork I'm super proud of. Um, it, it, um, it only happened for two weeks, but, but uh, it's, it's what I would call an anti-monument. Yes, and that illustrates perfectly, you know, how you transform technologies of suspicion into technologies of connection. So thank you so much. I think that, um, now we can uh, take some questions from um, the audience. Okay, we've got a few questions here. Let's start with one from Jennifer. Rafael, your work is so interactive and coupled with the subject of surveillance. Since Montreal is so shut down due to COVID, how has that impacted your upcoming projects? Yeah, so just like everybody else, we were hit very hard in the sense that all of our shows were canceled or postponed. Um, this is a difficult uh, thing for, for us in many different ways. Uh, one of them that is almost taboo to speak about is financial. So I run a studio where I pay well, 16 full-time people who have mortgages and kids and so on and so forth. And so at a time when all shows are canceled, you lose your income stream. So this was a very, very tough thing for us to navigate. Obviously nothing compared to the loss that people have had of actual, <laughs> actual deaths, right? I fortunately have not have that happen. I, I did get COVID in March, but, but after a few weeks I was, I was, I was uh, well. Um, but in terms of actually maintaining operations, how do you maintain uh, the studio uh, throughout a pandemic? I'm lucky in the sense that we're in Canada and the Canadian government gave us support to help us keep our employees. Um, but after a while, it, it just became impossible because, you know, there's just so, so many expenses and the, so on. So my studio actually lost half 
of its staff uh, throughout uh, the COVID. And this is people who I, you know, dearly wish that this had not happened. We're starting to see an opening again. So we're starting to get new shows. We're starting to hire people again. But, uh, but yeah, that impact was, was difficult. I don't think I've ever worked as hard as this entire year to try and see how, how I can keep my team together. And I think that that's one thing that, that is often not talked enough about um, when you're thinking about a studio of an artist. You're sometimes thinking, well, this artist is just in front of a canvas waiting for inspiration and whatever. It's a very solitary thing. In my case, and in the case of many other artist friends, I know that we work in teams. And so to be a good manager at a time of COVID um, and to be able to support people and sustain the practice was the most difficult part. Um, like I said, you know, respecting the fact that I didn't have any, any uh, human loss, but I'm sure others who did had a much worse time. Um, I, like everybody else, I, I, I did many things to change. I started meditating and I've done yoga. I stopped drinking caffeine. I got divorced. I did it all. I did like all the different things that you can do to change. I did them all. And, uh, but I really can't with the people who say, oh, I've learned from COVID. It's like, yeah, I, I'm so sick of it. I can't handle it anymore. I really need to, to get back to the place where we can all be together and enjoy and share. Okay, thank you. Another question, this is from Mira, or Myra. Raphael, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Would you please tell us of the challenges of organizing and creating a binational artwork as an order tuner? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so again, talking about the taboo subject of money, I really like to talk about money. In fact, somebody once told me, you're a budget artist, and it was meant to be an insult. And I was like, yeah, I write good budgets. I really care about the independence and autonomy of my practice. When we were working in the border, the single most difficult issue were not the permits to shoot 200,000 watts of xenon lights into the American airspace or microwave uh, point to point connections. The bigger issue was how to fund it. Um, in a site, in a place that needs money, um, it's, it's, in, it's in dire straits. Um, how do you show up with technology that belongs in the Olympics and in big sort of corporate shows and fund that? So the key here was that I did not want to get any money from the governments because in Mexico, we also have an ultranationalist government at that time. We still have it. And then, uh, of course, from the U.S., impossible. And so not from governments and also not from corporations who would want to put their logo everywhere and convert it into a Grand Prix. And so the issue became finding philanthropic organizations that would fund this. So a big part of the development of Border Tuner was to find the Mellon Foundation um, who supported the project, the Via Art Fund in Boston who supported the project, Arte Abierto in Mexico City who supported the project. So large scale uh, funders, uh, organizations, nonprofits who would believe in this project enough that they would fund it to the point they did. That meant that the piece was a true civic uh, platform. There was no advertising anywhere. No one would tell you what to say or not to say. And, um, and of course, no money is pure, right? It's, it's money from wealthy foundations and so on and so forth, but it's still the best that we could do for a project like this. Crucially, a part of the budget of Border Tuner was earmarked and separated to create a binational fund for the development of new art from local artists in the region. So this binational fund, we're hoping to make it yearly, um, will be directed to specifically uh, allow local artists to create a legacy. Because the problem is people such as myself who have this privilege to go and work and finesse all of the connections and, and funding to bring a piece like that, oftentimes show up at the border, make an artwork, and then get the hell out and there's no legacy. So I wanted to avoid that. And we did it by both donating the artwork that I showed you at the beginning, also by creating this fund that is now being awarded uh, yearly to create more artworks from the local communities, which I have to tell you, I have rarely seen art that is more important than what's happening at the border, at the US-Mexico border, because I've mm. met artists who are doing fundamental work 
um, with refugees, with uh, humanitarian causes, with nationalism. The U.S.-Mexico border is basically just a microcosm of what's going to happen all over the world as soon as we have migration patterns of people like trying to get away from flooding or from from uh, severe drought. Um, and so anything, this is a laboratory for, for how us artists can we react to the dire consequences of a system that has the richest and the poorest coexisting across a, a boundary. And so for me um, to be in there was really an experience to, of listening to the local people. Um, I went there eight times. I have dear friends now in the region. And honestly, I, I think we need to amplify their voices. And if this project can work to do that, then that's, that would be a successful intervention. All right. Cool. Uh, this next question is for you, Raphael, but Maria, I think you might want to uh, answer also, give a critical perspective. Your work, broadly speaking, engages the social reality of everyday surveillance. Do you believe it has implications for democracy or freedom? Do you imagine human existential possibilities be beyond surveillance? And what might that look like? Or are we inescapably trapped? Maria, that's for you. <laughs> oh, is it for me? You know, <laughs> no. I vacillate um, with this question because sometimes I think when the more I become aware of the levels of surveillance that we face daily, no matter, unless we, of course, the only alternative would be disconnecting. But when I become aware of that level of surveillance, I almost, I, I do feel trapped. But then I see artists who have used surveillance, like Rafael, for connective purposes, for creating options within the system, even as we become aware of the power um, and the control that, you know, wants to be exerted from multiple points. It's not just like one government or one corporation. It is, it is pretty much um, a very um, nomadic phenomena that is increasingly and always creative in finding other ways to, to survey us. So um, I think I vacillate depending on the day, but I do think that when you discover ways of connecting, of using technologies in the ways they were not intended, we're actually in a very good point to imagine uh, alternative futures. Mm, okay. And to follow up, here's a relate. Oh, Rafael, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, no, just just uh, sort of in keeping with with that. I mean, I've been saying if you guys have been following the uh, the movement to ban facial recognition, so I am very much uh, in favor of banning facial recognition, except for art. I think that art should be the one location where they should allow us to use it uh, because we're the only responsible users of, of this technology. Um, I, I'm kidding. I don't know if we're responsible or not, but I do, I do think that some of these artworks um, have a merit that, that, especially not the artworks themselves, but the response to the artworks. Yes. So it's never the artwork that will bring freedom or, or whatever. The artwork's only the seed, it's, it's only the little question, is the little intervention or interruption in the way that we see something. But I do believe that these small little homeopathic um, inputs eventually can you know, snowball into something that's bigger. And so whether it can bring freedom or democracy, I can't speak to that. What I can do though is as, as an artist who is also a citizen, I am appalled um, of the number of, of uh, people who are not speaking out to defend democratic institutions, for example. So I am very much interested in whenever I get a chance to speak about these pieces as the fundamental uh, participatory nature of society, right? In, in, in society, you want uh, people to emerge 
into, into, uh, into relationships, right? I've often said that, for example, what would happen if instead of having surveillance cameras, we replace them with projectors? What would happen if every surveillance camera in a park or in a shopping mall was replaced with a projector and they gave us images rather than take images away from us? And I maybe naively think that that would make us a safer society because it would give us an opportunity to gather around just like we used to in uh, in a fire or in a fountain uh, this image and interact with this image and interact with each other through the image and so uh, it, it, it's very difficult to pretend mm. that any of this will have a human existential possibilities. You know, of course, sometimes when I'm drunk, I believe I, 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 I can have an impact. But then, you know, you need to hum be humbled down and understand that you have no control or little control over those things. What you can do, uh, Khodorovsky said, the, the Chilean filmmaker said that you can't change the world, but you can start changing it. And I really like that. It's like, not because you can't change the world doesn't mean that you shouldn't just begin, you know, like just give, mm -hmm. it, give it a shot. Yes, because even if it is a pebble in the sand or in the ocean, it really creates ripples as small as they are. Um, and I like to um, refer to a, a notion by Dana Haraway, which is the, the notion of response dash ability. So it's not responsibility, but response dash ability, which allows you to respond in small ways, even if you're not going to cause a revolution and change the world overnight. That is lovely. Got a couple more here. Uh, this one is from Monica. The, digitally, the digitality are not a problem in your art. What elements have been added to your creative poetics in times of pandemic? Well, um, what elements have been added to my creative poetics? Well, I, one, one thing I would say that, that I think is, is, is important at the time of pandemic is, is the note I made about mourning and continuity. I think that oftentimes we think of them as a, as a dichotomy or a dialectic. It's, it's mourning and continuity is, is one and the same. And it's a very Mexican lesson, right? Like we are, we're always thinking in terms of death being present and it helps us live intensely. Um, the idea that absence and presence are not uh, opposites, um, that, that there is a continuum in that, there's a field, there's a, there's a passage. And I think that that would be one of the poetic things that I've been looking at in terms of how do we react to so much loss, right? Like what is it about time passing um, that, that we can recover and, and, and memorialize in a way that the COVID memorial that I made does. Um, so the cracked hourglass was my image, you know, this idea that we all have cycles and the cycles, you know, but prematurely, a lot of people have lost cycles because there was a crack in the hourglass. The sun has come down. Um, I would say, I would say that the idea of continuity and mourning um, as, as one field of activity that art can contribute to. Here's another from Mira Montes. Raphael. Could you please speak about your experiences with censorship or intimidation campaigns by the Mexican government? I am thinking about your artwork level of confidence and the Tlatik local one, but it could relate, apply to others as well. Right. So it's very interesting because in Mexico, so we get a lot of things wrong. But one thing that we got right in the Constitution is this absolute separation of the university from the government. And so if you are actually in UNAM University, the police and the military are not allowed in. They have their local police. Okay. It's a true autonomous institution. So when I did the Tatelolco Memorial, it was in the context of the UNAM University who made this possible. So I have, uh, whenever I've worked in Mexico, oftentimes it's been with UNAM. Um, so MUAC, the museum that commissioned the work for COVID Memorial is part of UNAM. 
um, then level of confidence, there was no interference because I just did this here in Montreal uh, at a distance. And so my feeling is that Mexico actually, despite having had a history of governments that have been corrupt and inept and sometimes uh, cruel and, and, and violent, um, there, there is a certain tolerance for criticism. There's a certain sense of, uh, of the artist is allowed to have a critical adversarial voice. Um, Jesus Rodriguez says that in Mexico, there is no censorship until you get killed. And so, you know, it, it, it hasn't happened yet. I, I will continue to be a critical voice. I, I have a feeling... I have a feeling that this happens in all countries, right? We all self-censor, right? Um, I think in the United States, I see I see movements of censorship that are really problematic. And the kind of movement of censorship that I'm thinking about, the one that concerns me the absolute most is corporate censorship, right? So I'm thinking about, for example, you know, the ways in which there is a code of conduct in shopping malls. And so therefore certain resistance cannot be done by law in side of the shopping mall compared to say the plaza which doesn't have said uh, or more problematically like for example the the censorship that happens in facebook and i don't mean the banning of trump which thank god that happened i'm talking about the idea that now um there are the metrics and the mechanisms for us to be enveloped into certain kinds of patterns of consumptions that are very difficult to be alternative to Alternative to what? We cannot be outside of the system that we're criticizing. And so for me, the, the question of censorship is a question also of us understanding it, not just as a global or a national issue, but something more about the spaces in which our transactions are happening, such as digital spaces, which are not neutral. They're spaces that are owned, they're monetized. And, uh, and to that degree, they will always curtail um, our freedom of speech in ways that, you know, further the mechanism of, of control, if that makes sense. I don't know if I made myself clear, but I would be more, more, I'm more concerned about who, you know, who and how and why does an artist get support or sponsorship from a company um, than I would be over a government um, deciding to invest in in some artists of course there's a lot of exceptions and so on but i just wanted to make it more problematic the question of censorship begins with oneself and uh, and then it has other other lives okay i think we have time for maybe one more question rafael some of your bi this is from guadalupe rafael some of your biometric pieces need people to touch a sensor in order to interact with it which i love but are you looking into touchless alternatives now in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, and in fact, I can show you one right now. Uh, so you can, be, uh, you can be the first ones to see this. So we have a new, so you know how I, a lot of my pieces, you have to hold on to the sensor or touch something to, to get your heartbeat. There's a new technology called photoplethysmography. And if you go to a new artwork that we're just getting ready to launch called onpulse.net, you arrive at a website. Uh, one moment, what's going on? You arrive at a website where we use photoplethysmography to detect your face. And then we sense minute changes in the coloration of your skin to create an electrocardiogram and extract your heartbeat out of the webcam itself. And this system now works also out of my heartbeat. And this system now also works with um, a phone camera. And so um, um, that's, 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 that's one thing that we're doing. That we're doing. Sorry, that's one thing that we're doing. We're trying to do contactless sensing um, for this kind of uh, for this kind of work, um, but I, I have no doubt that soon we'll all be vaccinated because we believe in vaccines and we understand science shows us that this is the way out of this problem and 
you know, there was no 5G memory being installed or whatever the conspiracy theory of the day is. So soon we'll all be vaccinated and we'll be holding not only to the art, but to each other, hopefully. Do you want to take one more? Sure, I'm for it. Okay, this is, thank you, Rafael, Maria, and Paul for bringing this interesting talk to life. My question would be to Raphael and how he has dealt with including general public or recordings from people into his work. Is there any drawn line about public consent to be aware of? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question, yes. So it depends on the country. So when we did the piece with the big shadows, um, it turns out that in Holland, which is where we first started, if you photograph more than three people in the same shot, then it's a shot of a crowd and you don't need to ask them for permission. So the photos that we took were always in outside the tramways. Wait, people were waiting in line to get into the tramway, photograph them there, and then they're considered crowd shots. Others, other countries, they do need permission. Oftentimes we do the typical thing that you find in, uh, in, uh, in uh, movie shoots. It says there's posters everywhere that says you're entering an area that is being recorded for an artwork. And if you don't want to be par participate in this, then don't enter the street or something like that. And then yet other times, for example, a, when you go in to see one of my exhibitions, like the one that we're having at Esset MoMA in October, the first thing that you see is um, this exhibition features artworks that listen to you, sense you, look at you, and, uh, and want to incorporate you to be an integral part of the artwork. If you don't want to have, if you don't want to um, uh, be a part of the artwork and be recorded in such a way, then don't enter. And I really like that because it's like right the first thing that you see is like a, uh, a what, what Bertolt Brecht would call the noticing of the knots. So you have to reveal the mechanisms right away so that people can make a choice over whether they would participate or not. I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the people do want to participate. And what's interesting and important in my work is that we're not recording and archiving. We're always recording and then erasing the oldest recordings. So for us, if you remember that piece with the fingerprints or my pieces with the heartbeat, we record your heartbeat, it's added to the other heartbeats, and then the next participant pushes all recordings one position down, so one it's forgotten. So for me, contrary to say the work of, um, oh my God, what's the French artist, Boltansky. Boltansky's uh, heartbeat piece, which is later than mine, um, records and archives every single heartbeat that it finds. Mine, it actually just keeps it there for the interim whilst new recordings get added and old ones are forgotten. So in, the, in so doing, I'm, I'm hoping to elicit more of a sense of memento mori, you know, the, the idea that we're only around for a little bit. Um, so that's how we do it. We, we try and be very uh, upfront about that, about the recording. Maria, did you want to add anything? No, I'm, I'm actually, um, you know, he said what needed to be said. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. There's, there's a question that I can see here. If you don't mind, I'd like to answer it. So Sam sure. Meads is saying, how do you decide how to mediate, facilitate how audiences interact with your work? And to what extent do they follow that? To what extent do you adapt to audiences' actual interactions? This is a really great question because... Um, very often you're trying to elicit uh, or provoke or question and you want to get a response from them, right? So the very good example is the very first time that I used Shadows, it wasn't in Body Movies, which is a playful piece. It was in a piece called Repositioning Fear, where for me the shadow was like a very ominous, more now expressionistic expression of your subconscious or otherness or monstrosity. And in fact, as soon as people started playing with it, I realized I was completely wrong. There was no sense of Nosferatu or anything like that. It was all like, it was all playful. And so I'm, my next shadow play, Body Movies, was a very playful piece, having learned from this other one um, that I got completely wrong. Um, and then Sam is saying that he, saw, he or she saw a cloud display in, in Manchester and the users were given a specific instruction. And the instruction was, we call that a provocation. There was a little text um, that basically said, uh, 
say, say um, mention something you would like to disappear. Because when you would met, speak into this microphone, whatever you said would appear in this cloud of text on, on a fountain that would write your text, your voice in midair, and then it would disappear. So most people uh, said things like poverty or Brian Eno said tax evasion. I would like tax evasion to disappear and, it, and then it disappears. But Sam is right that people just wrote whatever they want. They, they said, fuck Brexit or things like that. And that's lovely. I love it when people don't follow instructions because then it's the moment where you realize that the artwork has, is, you no longer have a monopoly over how it's going to be interpreted. It becomes its own, it has its own awareness and its own choices. And I, I really love that moment because then I just become one more of the public uh, seeing the work uh, develop over time. Okay, I think we've reached the end of the hour. Maria and Raphael, thank you for an incredible discussion. And I wish you both the best and hopefully we'll see each other on the other side of this pandemic. And I'd like to, to thank the audience for participating and let me apologize to those of you who submitted questions and were just unable to get to them. In any case, thank you all and take care. Bye-bye. Ciao. 